Hello, I'm Deepak Bhatt, here with my good friend and colleague, Professor Gabriel Steg. We are reporting live for ACC.org from ESC 2018. It's ESC Congress, and it is packed full of good stuff here. Lots of late-breaking trials, late-breaking registry results, really a great buzz about the meeting. Actually, I was just walking through the registration area. Fortunately, I registered yesterday. It is totally packed. It's long lines, but, but I think that's a good thing. So let's start off with the culprit shock trial. The initial 30-day results were published in the New England Journal of Medicine, but now we hear here is a late breaker, the one-year results from that important study. Do you want to give us a recap? Yeah, so it's addressing an important question. Should we uh, com do complete revascularization in patients with cardiogenic shock and multivessel disease, or should we only focus on the culprit lesion in the acute stage? And I think the 30-day results presented last year and published in the New England Journal of Medicine were a surprise, a shock, if I may <laughs> say, they were. to a lot of colleagues because they did show that death or the need for renal replacement therapy was actually lower at 30 days in patients who underwent uh, index lesion or culprit lesion only revascularization as opposed to a multi-lesion revascularization or complete revascularization. So that was a surprise because everybody sort of expected the reverse. Now the investigators have continued follow-up up to a year, and although there is no statistically significant difference, there's a borderline reduction in one-year mortality in the group that underwent only culprit lesion revascularization, suggesting that the benefits of not doing complete revascularization are not lost over, lost over a year. There's no difference in reinfarction, but there is uh, less uh, readmission for heart failure and um, um, uh, there's less readmission for heart failure and less need for complete revascularization in patients who've underwent complete revascularization up front. So there's sort of a balance of risk and benefit. Uh, mortality is trending in favor of culprit lesion only, but readmission for heart failure and uh, the need for further revascularization are lower in patients who underwent complete revascularization. But to me, the message is different. The message is that more than half of these patients are dead after a year. And I think it shows how much progress we still have to make in the care of these patients. We certainly shouldn't focus on complete revascularization up front. That's clearly not beneficial. And we need to do much better at improving the long-term survival of these patients. Yeah, I agree. It's an important study. I, I know in my own practice, I always thought, open up everything during that index procedure. And I think that's what most of our interventional colleagues have been doing. But with this study now showing the one-year results, pretty concordant with the 30-day, really it's hard on a data-driven basis to do that anymore, I'd say. Open up the index uh, trouble-causing vessel, and then you know afterwards, if you need to open up more the day or two later or a week later, do it, but not during that index procedure. Would you agree? Absolutely. So another trial where there were prior early results presented, but now we're seeing one-year results is a matrix trial. And the matrix trial uh, had a couple of different randomizations, randomizing patients to bivalrudin and also to radial versus femoral. So the bivalrudin part, I, I guess I'd have to say, really is negative. That is, it's not showing any benefit for bivalrudin for the primary endpoint. Uh, even the bleeding uh, findings are a bit attenuated. So overall, not... Uh, supporting uh, bivalrudin use, I would have to say. What do you think about that part? Well, I would slightly challenge you because... Oh, good. We need to do something to Because keep it even though the primary endpoint uh, and the net uh, adverse clinical events, which were the, the co-primary endpoints of the trial, were actually no different between study arms, cardiovascular mortality and all-cause mortality actually were lower for patients receiving bivalrudin at 30 days. That difference was not maintained at a year, but at 30 days, there certainly was a significant reduction in cardiovascular mortality, which I think is really potentially important for a treatment that you give only once. Yeah, no, that's a good point. So I guess for those folks that are bivalrudin believers, there's still something in the matrix trial. But I must say bivalrudin use has really fallen off, at least in the U.S. I don't think it was ever that high in Europe to begin with. Uh, the other part... Radial versus femoral, you know, radial continues to look good for those folks that are radial enthusiasts, and that number is growing worldwide. Uh, although, strictly speaking, not all the endpoints, you know, met p-values and, and were truly statistically significant, but at least signals uh, of uh, radial having some influence on ischemic events. How did you interpret, you know, some borderline p-values? The same. I, I, I noted that, again, cardiovascular mortality was lower at 30 days. Now, one would not expect using the radial access as opposed to femoral access to have long-term mortality benefits because we know that it's a minute contribution to all-cause mortality long-term. Right. But certainly at 30 days, there was a statistically significant reduction in mortality. And I think that for 
us radial enthusiasts, that's really comforting. No, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, for folks that are converting to radial, it's, it's more evidence that supports it. Well, we've got a bunch of other things to cover. Uh, let's just look at them uh, or discuss them really quickly. Uh, the Scott Hart study, that examined uh, CT angiography, and these results now, we, we saw some earlier data here as well, show a reduction in myocardial infarction associated, well, I shouldn't say associated, really attributed to uh, use of CT angiography. What do you think? Is it real? I think it's real. I think it's, uh, what's interesting is that the investigators looked at the use of evidence-based therapy, in second, particularly for secondary prevention therapies, and they found that in this randomized trial, the use was higher in patients who were assigned to CT in addition to, to routine clinical care. And I think there's a message here. When once patients and physicians see the disease, they're probably more prone to proper use of evidence-based therapies. And I think that's probably the explanation for the reduction in adverse outcomes. Yeah, seeing the plaque seems to matter for the doctor, maybe for the patient. All right, what about the Clarify Registry? You were involved in leading that. There was some interesting data presented here about beta blockade. Yes, it's, it's, it's an important topic in routine clinical practice. I mean, which, which anti-anginal agents should we use in patients with stable CAD? whether or not they have symptoms. We know that beta blockers and calcium channel blockers are widely used in patients with stable CAD, even when they don't have angina, by the way. Right. And the evidence for this is actually very limited. There were a few randomized trials that were conducted more than 30 years ago before the era of revascularization and when outcomes were so different and care was so right. different that it's really difficult to extend that evidence to today's routine clinical practice. And today there is really no recent randomized trial data to support or uh, uh, argue against the use of these agents. So what we have are observational series. And the Clarify registry is a large observational registry of more than 30,000 patients with all forms of stable coronary artery disease, symptomatic or not, with previous PCI or not, with previous MI or not. And these patients were uh, compared according to the use of beta blockers at baseline, but also during follow-up. Uh, and they were also compared, by the way, for the use of calcium channel blockers because these are widely prescribed as well. Right. And what we found is that approximately 80% of the patients were on beta blockers, 20% of the patients were not on beta blockers. Clearly, these groups are very different. And the good thing is that the registry did capture contraindications and comorbidities, so we can adjust for this. And when we try to get away from the confounding by indication with all sorts of adjustment, what we observe is that there is no mortality benefit of the use of beta blockers or calcium channel blockers long term. There's no prognostic benefit of the use of these agents, with one exception, patients who've had an MI in the previous year. Makes so this sense. would argue to use beta blockers in the first year post-MI, and thereafter, beyond one year, or in patients who haven't had an MI, and there are many stable CAD patients who haven't had an MI, then the use of beta blockers or calcium channel blockers probably should be reserved for symptom control. Yeah, I think that's good advice, and you know, it's paralleling what's happening in a lot of primary care practices where beta blockers used to be used a lot for hypertension, and now really they're not first-line agents. Well, let's move on to the uh, final topic. Maybe if you could say a quick word about the fourth defini universal definition of MI that just came out. Probably a lot of people, at least in the U.S., haven't had a chance to even look at it. Uh, can you tell us in a brief nutshell exactly what's new about this new definition? Well, it's a long and important document that I think every cardiologist needs to read. I think that probably the main uh, novelty in this document is the uh, identification of the concept of myocardial injury distinct from myocardial infarction. That's been a source of a lot of uh, uh, confusion in the past because we now have assays such as high sensitivity troponin that are able to oh, pick yeah. myocardial injury in extremely sensitive fashion. We actually just switched to the fifth generation assay uh, about two months ago at my hospital and I'll tell you I was on the consult service I think two weeks after that switch it was a zoo. I mean there were just so many troponin positive patients and it, it created a lot of work, it kept us busy. And so I think the universal definition is focusing exactly on this to explain how we should not call every troponin rise a myocardial infarction. And to me, this is really the important conceptual oh, change yes. and message from, these, from this definition. And I really encourage everybody to read it. There's also a lot of novel in, and interesting information about how we should relate myocardial infarction with normal coronary arteries, uh, what we should think of Takotsubo and how it positions itself. Uh, it's a great document with great tables and illustrations. I encourage everybody to read this. 
Excellent. I haven't had a chance yet, but maybe on the flight back home I'll take a peek. Well, I'd like to thank Professor Steg for joining us on ACC.org, and thank you to those of you at home. Hopefully you're getting a sense of what ESC 2018 is like in Munich. Thank you very much.